Jimmy and I are children of war. We have witnessed the ultimate in disconnection. Our life's mission is to bring a completely new culture of connection. With couples around the world, we create these little laboratories, and when there will be enough of those laboratories, there will be a tipping point in consciousness about the power of connection. I had to go all the way to Antwerp, Belgium. I was living in Los Angeles. It was practically halfway around the globe where I found uh, somebody who looked to me at the time as a Jewish geisha. Of course, little did I know that inside this Jewish geisha was a budding firebrand feminist. She started examining our relationship, and for me, that was very threatening. To me, it looked like it's the end of not only our relationship, but it's probably the end of me, because uh, for many years, I dreamt of having a family where things would be loving and quiet and nice instead of the storminess of the family that I lived in. So when I met Heidi and I felt this is a woman with whom we're gonna have this happy, totally joyous, fulfilling life. And suddenly, this woman disappeared. Instead of that, who showed up is a very assertive, threatening female. Over the years, we both developed a relationship that I would say coping relationship. You know, Heidi did her thing, I did my thing. We eventually became conscious of what was going on. Uh, maybe there's something better than just coping. We've been married 42, nearly 42 years, and he is my 15th husband in that long marriage. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, the first man Yumi, that I married 41 years ago. He was the silent type. He never talked. I didn't know if he ever would. I think it was practical, though, for me <laughs> at actually, the time. Actually, as I remember, you know, I was by nature kind of taciturn. Um, so much genetic in our family on the male side. Um, at the same time, as I look back, as I play the video of our early life, it doesn't seem like actually there's much of an opening for me to talk. <laughs> One day I came home and the house was in a mess. There was no dinner on the table. Um, table wasn't set. What happened? Well, turns out Haiti decided to enroll in UCLA. This was in the 1960s. How many of you remember what was going on in the 1960s <laughs> on campuses? Okay, women's liberation, among other things, women's liberation. And who was the torchbearer of women's liberation? My wife, <laughs> the Gisha, the Gisha. You know what our problem was? Sitting there, <laughs> sitting there with a striped shirt. Because really, if he would only talk a little, express feelings a little, you know, connect a little, do something in our marriage, we wouldn't have a problem. In our household, you know, I, I was the ogre, the designated ogre. Heidi was the angel. You know, she would say, you know, to the kids, if they did something, wait till daddy comes home, he'll deal with it. It made me feel like there was always a coalition against me. In our living room, we had a carpet that looked like the Alps because we were sweeping so many things under it. We didn't know how to talk about things that were important. 
And you know, I learned that there is no problem in relationship, actually. Now, that's a very big paradigm shift. There is no problem. There is an adventure. And we don't always know how to embark on that adventure. We don't always know how to stay on that adventure. We don't always know how to equip ourselves for that adventure. My father is German and my mom's Trinidadian. And Morgan, you know, born in East Africa, um, totally different way of life. This was my other pea in the pod. He was my soulmate, all those things. And we were infectiously happy. And something changed. I was looking for a partner in my life. She was more so involved in the first five years. But later she was, I'm not interested in doing this, I'm not interested in doing that, so. I realized that because we weren't communicating so much, there was an incentive to come home early to spend that time. The more longer she stayed at work, is the longer I will remove myself from the relationship. I will find comfort in different things, doing, i.e. going to the gym or walking by myself or going to the bar, having a few beers with my friends. He came home from shopping. I said, let's, let's talk, right? And he's like, you know what? I just need to clear my head. I need to think about a few things. I'll be back and we'll talk about it then. I don't know what time he left, but he got home at 10 to 1 in the morning. Trust me when I tell you, his bags were packed. <laughs> and I refuse to be with a man who does not respect me. And if that meant raising a child on my own or co-parenting, I refuse to remain in a relationship that a person is not loving and supportive of me. You go to work at 6.30 in the morning, and I usually go to work at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's why I would love and to have a 10 o'clock in the morning job. That's the best you get to sleep I, in. I feel in a way like I wake up Late. around, I, I feel that my prime time is about 12 noon onwards. That's fine, you can have. Okay, we're gonna stop it right here. Okay. <laughs> now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask the group as if they watched you and you were speaking a language they do not understand, but they saw the energy. And they saw what happened in the space here in between. And I'm going to ask them, what did you see? My analogy was a sword fight. Sword fight. Be because if you don't block the sword, there would actually be injury. It looked to me like a tennis match. Boing there, boing there. Boing to you, over to you. What I saw was um, something like trench warfare. Um, <laughs> both dug in and the barrels of blame sort of aimed across no man's land. Your relationship lives in the space between you. Your relationship lives here. Now, no one has ever pointed you to this space. You've never known there is something called the relational space. But the relational space is like a piece of real estate that you inherited when you came together as a couple. This is our environment. And if we are not conscious of it, we will automatically pollute it. To be conscious of the space is to choose what we will put into that space. Are we gonna put our resentments, our anger, our disappointments, our cynicism, our criticisms, is that what we're going to put into the space? Are we going to put our appreciation, our compassion, our generosity of spirit, our curiosity, our embrace of the other into the space? Now, how do you honor the space? Because your children will live in that space and you live in that space. How do you honor it? How do you make it a safe space? You do that by learning to become present to the other person. And the beauty is this. There's like a little bridge here that all of us receive as a gift. Mm -hmm. You see the bridge here? Mm -hmm. That bridge is the bridge between Morgan world and Teresa world. 
That's an incredible thing because they're different worlds. Totally. Totally different worlds. <laughs> <laughs> they are. I mean, that's how it is. We are a different world in our party. Describe like myself as a lion. I'm uh, heard as an impala to me. That's right. What happens is connection, because when somebody comes to me, let's say when Heidi comes to me, when she leaves everything that defines her, I feel her presence, she's here. And she's really curious about listening to me. She's with me. That is a wonderfully warm and healing sensation. And you say like this, Teresa, Morgan, I'd like to invite you I want you to come over the bridge to my world. There's something very important I want to say to you. And what you do, Morgan, is you say, OK. And you take the time to go over the bridge till you land in Teresa world. And when you're there, you say, I'm with you, and I'm ready to hear you. OK? So you make the invitation. Morgan, I'm inviting you over to Teresa World, I have something important to share with you. You say, OK, I'm coming over. OK, I'm, I'm here. I'm coming over. I'm on my way. Yes, I'm on my way. I'm jumping over the bridge now. That's right. You can't jump over the bridge. You have to walk slowly, because you've got to leave everything that belongs to you in your own world. This is critical, because I'm five and a half months pregnant. And I want, I want to raise a child in an environment where there is open communication, where there is love and understanding. I hear you saying you want to be safe and understood. Yes. Is there more? Is there more? Yes. And to be understood leads to a connection and intimacy. Very often, the men are the ones who get dragged to the workshop. And they are flabbergasted, because for the first time, they're beginning to see, like I did when the first time I did the workshop with couples, I saw that there is such a thing as relationships, that feelings are not something to be hidden but something to be used in the service of the relationship, in the service of cleaning out the space. If this is your first visit, then yeah. just look. Crossing the bridge is not an intellectual exercise. Crossing the bridge is actually bringing your whole personhood. You come across the bridge with your compassion and your curiosity, your warmth, your embrace, your welcome. You leave in your own world your opinions, your resentments, your story, your drama, your ego, your what makes you an identity. You leave that. I hear you saying, <clears throat> the more we understand, I hear you, you're gonna have better communication and enjoy. Exactly. Yeah, I got you. Exactly. Beautiful. Crossing the bridge into the other person's territory, it is much more difficult to put your ideas, your emotions, your hurts, and your pains on the shelf and to openly be present with the other person. I have learned that that is very difficult, and yet, when you do, it is amazingly rewarding. Yes. And you've done very well. Keep looking. Look at that. To me, the space was so toxic. It's like, I can't be in this presence of this anymore. It is too toxic. I didn't know how to get out of that, though. I didn't know how to change that. The, the kids were the focus doing things for the kids, taking them here, taking them there. And all of a sudden when that's gone, especially as you get older, if you don't want to deal with any conflict, then you tend to put up with 
you know, just maintain the status quo in that relationship. That space between, I never really thought about it like that. You know, there's me and there's Jim, and then there's that space between us and how to not get it, you know, not to keep it polluted. Emotional pollution, I assert, is the most important pollution that we need to deal with. If we deal with emotional pollution, then all the other pollutions are gonna be dealt with much more easily. Environmental, you know, atmospheric pollution, water pollution. If we create emotional cleanliness our partner, we clean up the emotional pollution that is rampant in our, all our relationships. I remember when we first began to uh, know that you can visit each other, we went on a vacation to Stockholm. We decided that we had fought in so many cities of the world. <laughs> and that we had told each other in so many cities of the world, why did we spend so much money to come so far to fight? <laughs> then in Stockholm, any time we would have an issue, we would sit on a bench and visit with each other. Every bench of Stockholm. But it was the first vacation where we created a real connection to each other. We've been visiting each other, getting to know each other, getting to live with each other in a conscious way for the past 17 years. The difference being that in the beginning, there was a hell of a lot of energy, a lot of energy behind our discussions because we had so much accumulated uh, frustrations, pain, disappointments, both of us had been practicing engineering for a long time. And Heidi went to study psychology and she got a degree in clinical psychology at Tel Aviv University. When Heidi decided to go ahead and train as a workshop presenter, and because the subject, the subject of relationship interested me very, very much. I told her, you know, this looks like a wonderful opportunity for us to work together. There's a human hunger to be valued, to be appreciated, to be acknowledged and to be understood. And with that human hunger, when someone comes across the bridge and hears you and listens to you, that hunger is satiated. I have something really important to tell you and I'd like to invite you over the bridge into my world. Okay, I'll come over to your world and I'm here. We just had a, a fear that we were losing our sense of connection. We'd been trying to have a child for a period of time and she was a natural conception, so she was a bit of a miracle. In that place of just having to attend to things day to day, just of having to help Leah be healthy, the us part was getting lost. The biggest thing for me was uh, finding a place to be in relationship with Gail that wasn't, uh, wasn't always, wasn't about getting my own way or, or, or like the power struggle. In my world, people aren't, they don't stay. And I never knew how important it was to me to have a man come into my world and stay no matter what. And you've done that for me. And I'm so, so grateful you for that gift. So I hear you say that in your world, you're grateful for me coming into your world and staying with you. You haven't had that before. And look, Roger, look at her face now. Start seeing the impact of your presence in her world. Look. Take in what you see happens when you show up because you are who you are in her world. Look.
Our relationship is like a little laboratory. And in that laboratory, we help each other become mature adults. And think about a planet populated by these little laboratories. So that within a generation, within one generation, we have relationally mature people walking on the planet. That amazing saying by Rumi, the Persian poet of the 13th century, who said, beyond right thinking, and beyond wrong thinking, there is a field. I will meet you there. And what we're teaching the couple is to meet in that field beyond right thinking and beyond wrong thinking. Nature has a way of having you get attracted to the most incompatible human being in the entire universe. Where you are alive, they are blocked. Where you are blocked, they are alive. Every single person has come to this workshop with the absolute perfect partner who is most capable of giving them the worst nightmare. We are programmed, in a sense, to fall in love with each other, but we are also programmed to have this power struggle and this fight with each other, because it is what we hired each other for. We hired each other to push these buttons. These buttons are connected to very important places in our history. When you're big and you go looking for a partner, that picture is like a scanner. And you eyeball a lot of people and you go, not you, 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 not you. Every single person here is a reject. <laughs> and in a lifetime, that scanner stops at one person. OK, two. <laughs> OK, some people, five. <laughs> OK, Jaja Gabor, 10. <laughs> but it doesn't stop with everybody. It stops with a specific person. And when it stops, you have a physical reaction. And after a week with that person, you say the weirdest thing to them. You say, you know what? It feels like I've known you my whole life. <laughs> you have. <laughs> it's your mother and your father. You found them. I was born in August 1944 in a refugee camp in Switzerland. Parents who had escaped from concentration camp in Vichy, France. And when they got to the Swiss border, the border was closed to refugees. They had too many already. But my mother threw herself through the border and fell on the other side. And somehow my father smuggled himself also. There was this undercurrent of loss in our home. My father and mother had lost their parents and brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces and all the names we've seen today you know it's like that was actually the way our walls were at home and Yumi lived with names on his wall the first time when i was personally touched by events connected with the Holocaust was when I lost my two sisters. There was a real push for Jews to try to escape from Romania. There were small boats that were uh, acquired for the purpose of helping Jews escape. And my family managed to put my sisters on the boat. And the boat was gone sunk by Germans. You know, the survivors were machine gunned. I had a very, very close connection with my older sister. She was about three years younger. Matter of fact, I remember when we were kids, we thought that when we grow up, we'll marry each other. On a conscious level, I just fell in love with him and he with me and we got married and while the wonderful love drug was coursing through our veins, we didn't know we had looked for that loss. You know when 
my scanner went around, I saw a lot of guys. They were sociable, fun, spontaneous. But then I met this depressive. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in love. <laughs> and I had grown up at some level with a father who couldn't reclaim his zest for living. I found somebody like that. But if that person was willing to reclaim his zest for living, for me, for nobody else, but for me, then I finished my childhood because a sad man becomes a happy man and a withdrawn man becomes an open man. So you find the most incompatible person who can least give you what you want the most. But if you help each other, you will reclaim the lost parts. And if you dare to stretch for the other, one person heals and the other person grows. I live here in Vancouver with my two boys. Uh, and we met about six years ago, five and a half, six years ago. And Terry lives on the island, has a great job. first day of me arriving or Terry arriving is, you know, we're kind of awkward. I've been the king of my castle, he's been the king of his, and then we come together and so we kind of, there's tension there and then, you know, a couple days are really great and then more tension before I leave because we're getting ready to miss each other and it just seems, so when I thought of the future I just thought, oh, it just seems really long and really hard. She basically at one point did say, you know, I need to take a break. And I was devastated. I was totally caught off guard. What do you mean? Like, surely there's another option, you know? And nope, it's a break and it's effective today. What's the point of being with somebody who doesn't believe in happily ever after? And I was worried that she was going to push off. I wasn't shutting down intentionally. I just, I didn't think it was possible to be with the same person forever. And I didn't have any models of happy marriages or anything, so I just, I didn't know. The most important stumbling block in every relationship turns out to be stuff we didn't finish with our parents or people who were the closest to us that the best way to clean out the pollution in this space is also to clean out the pollution that occurred in our relationship with our parents. Perry, you are my mom. It's her mom. You actually cross the bridge and land in the world of that little girl. And you say, I am your mom. What is it like to live with me? I am your mom. What's it like to live with me? A very beautiful, beautiful ritual that we uh, assist couples in doing is the parent visiting over the bridge. So it's as if your parents have learned actually that there is a space. And your parents have learned that there is a bridge. And they're coming over. You invite them actually as a little child because you really have something you want to share with them. Um, you're mad a lot. Everything that's me bugs you. So I just feel like I need to be not seen at all, just kind of hide. And I don't know, I think you're supposed to tell me I'm great. I don't seem to celebrate you. I seem to kind of keep you in your place, mediocre. And it feels like I should probably be a little more over the top, making you feel great. You as a child, grown up, but child now talking to the parent, discover your own story and your partner discovers your story and grows their compassion tremendously and their sense of connection to you. But even more than that, they hear you say some things to mother and father that actually you're saying on a daily basis.
to them. And suddenly what happens is that the projection onto the partner of mother-father can actually dissolve. And you can have a real relationship with your partner rather than with mother and father substitute. So you need me not to be mad at you all the time, not to blame you, not to be mad at dad, and you need me to see that you're good. Then maybe I'd tell you more about me and want to be around you more. Just remembering that we're just little wounded children, and now with the work that we've done and been introduced to, like just a little taste of it is like, oh my God, this is really possible, right? Like, I can see it, and I, I couldn't before. So it's just a huge gift, and to be able to say that to Terry, and I'm not sure if he believes me yet, but I think he will. What I most appreciated about you was how easy it seemed for you to say all those nice things that I wanted my mom to say. So I hear you say. So I hear you say that what you most appreciate about me is how easy it was for me to say all the nice things that you wanted your mom to say. And the thing I most appreciated about you is that your turtle that stuck her neck out. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have to do anything to get you to stick your neck out. I just sat here, mm -hmm. which was refreshing. <laughs> Once we know about the space and when, once we know about the bridge, in a sense, exiting is not an option anymore because we actually know a different way, a way that gives us a very natural road to each other. How I found out um, about the infidelity was my intuition sort of told me that this event took place and I asked Donna and at first she said no and I asked her again and she said yes, it did happen. It pushes a big button for me growing up in an alcoholic household. Um, my, my issue, I'm afraid to be abandoned. When Jen found out we both sort of retreated into our own worlds and, and we're feeling, um, you know, feeling our own emotions. And when we did communicate with each other, we, we could barely talk to each other without it escalating, you know, either to anger or tears or, or hurt or, you know, just, it, we really couldn't communicate, we weren't communicating at all. I normally protect my heart because I've been hurt a lot. And as you know, my family background, I don't come from the Brady Bunch or Warden June Cleaver. In fact, I come from Psychoville. And I've been an imposter. I would like to admit that truth and I would like to stop protecting myself and stop being afraid of letting you in my heart fully and completely. And my racket is that I've been showing up in our relationship recently in times of trouble as a seven-year-old girl. She was afraid to open her heart because if I did, I'd, I'd get hit. <laughs> get abused. <laughs> Allow yourself to let Jennifer's statement really penetrate. I hear you say when you were a seven-year-old girl you didn't talk about how you were feeling because you were afraid that you would get hit or abused. I've learned that I don't need to be that little girl anymore. 
the, the recognition of why the crisis happened. I was blaming Donna and I took the crisis very personally like I wasn't worthy of being loved and see look there's proof yet I recognized my part in it okay we had done the work on communicating coming back together talking about the anger the sadness the betrayal we did all of that but the piece we were missing was the connection why we love each other why we want to stay together tell me all about it I'm right here The first big change is the consciousness of that sacred space and the willingness to bring my full presence into the world of the other. That already is profound transformation. And there's more because a relationship has a phenomenal ingredient that is like the source for change. And that ingredient is frustrations. Yumi could say, you know, it's a pleasure to drive with Haiti. All I have to do is hold the, the steering wheel because she's going to tell me, turn right, turn left, <laughs> park here, park there. <clears throat> it's a total relaxation. I don't really have to think. I hold the wheel, she directs. It's so fun. <laughs> but if he was micromanaged in his childhood, it wouldn't be fun. He'd be tense and he couldn't stand it. This is really will sound to you as the most ridiculous of frustrations. <laughs> it frustrates me that Haiti hangs the toilet paper so it unfurls <laughs> clockwise rather than <laughs> counterclockwise. She winds up with about 10 feet, which she then <laughs> more makes into a ball. <laughs> Tiny frustrations reach back to very significant parts of your childhood. The way they touch your childhood is not necessarily one-to-one, -one, namely somebody, you know, you had an issue around toilet paper when you were a kid. That's not what we're talking about. It's about the feelings that come up when I watch Haiti wasting. What does that take me back to? It takes me back to a family where I never got an allowance. Oh, where I so wanted an ice cream that I actually stole some money from my governess, was discovered, and wound up locked up in the cellar. Now, it wasn't a basement. It was a Transylvanian <laughs> cellar. <laughs> it was terrible, and I was knocking on the door. Let me out, let me out. So do I have an association with <laughs> toilet paper? <laughs> You betcha! <laughs> Medwin, I would like to invite you over the bridge. I have a small frustration. What frustrates me is having to move your shoes out of the way to access the clothes in the closet. Tiny frustrations have roots into the same early childhood hurts than big frustrations. So it's kind of like leaving your socks on the floor and not having enough sex goes to the same place of pay attention to me, listen to what I have to say, be with me, honor me, goes to the same place in childhood. So rather tackle you're leaving your socks on the floor than we're not having enough sex because leaving the socks on the floor, you can really begin to change. And so the way I felt as a little girl was, the, was that the world is an unsafe place there's no room for me to be in it and to be who I am. And so I don't have much desire to be here. It makes a lot of sense to me. Because as a little child, you're so dependent on other people to make space for you. You don't know how to ask for it. And if nobody notices you,
How do you know you're there? And now you see, you know, Karen, I'm starting to understand a little bit about when I leave my shoes. <laughs> In front of the closet where you have to go reach your clothes. <laughs> so. <sighs> so, Karen. I am beginning to understand a little bit about how you feel when I leave my shoes all the time. I, I leave when my shoes, in fact, live <laughs> in your way. <laughs> in between you and your clothes, my large shoes. <laughs> My three or four <laughs> pairs. <laughs> and now you check. Have I understood you? <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to check. <laughs> <laughs> Have I understood you completely? <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Make it loud. Totally. That's the one. Completely. <laughs> Amazingly. <Yeah>. Wondrously. <laughs> Extraordinarily. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and when you're ready, you say, you know, Karen, what I'm going to give you as an unconditional gift is. You know, Karen, what I would love to give you. What I'm going to. What I am going to give you. As an unconditional gift. As an unconditional gift. Is I am going to spend five minutes with you every day for the next three weeks sitting together in silence looking into each other's eyes. And you say, thank you. Thank you. In receiving this gift over the next three weeks, it will help reduce my fear of. In receiving this gift over the next three weeks, it will help reduce my fear that I do not exist. You know, you say like this, now we come to the double gift. You know you're very welcome. It's a gift for you, and it's a gift for me. It's a gift for you. It's a gift for me. For when I sit with you for five minutes every day, looking at you. In silence. In silence. It will help me reclaim my open, loving heart. I'm much more aware of my time and how it affects him. And now that I understand that, um, how important it is to him. In the end, it was like he missed his father because his father, uh, you know, worked um, on the railroad and he was away a lot. And he never had that quality time to spend with him, particularly at night after he came home from work before going to bed, that quality time. And once I became aware of that, it totally, you empathize with your with your partner. You know, I mean, you care. You love you love each other, right? So it's not about me saying this is who I am and that's you. You have to accept me. I understood his needs, and you automatically want to change. It's not you know um, someone forcing you to change. It's just like I understand why he needs me to be on time. I don't know why this is coming to me now, but it's because it's Vancouver. I have to tell you this. When you and I came to Vancouver, it should probably be nine years ago now. Our life was so busy that we packed for the trip at midnight, and our, we had to leave for the airport at 6 in the morning. And so at midnight, we were packing, and Yumi pulled out a white jacket from the closet. And I said, Yumi, you're not taking that jacket. <laughs> and Yumi said, I am taking that jacket. 
And I said, their jacket is ugly. He said, I, <laughs> he said, I love their jacket. <laughs> we weren't crossing the bridge, are you noticing? <laughs> But we knew enough that if we continued that one, it would get very bad. Mm -hmm. So we stopped it, but we did go to sleep back to back, <laughs> which all of you know about that. <laughs> and he was probably thinking, you know, who does she think she's controlling here? You know, do I need a controller? Which jacket I'm going to take? And so Yumi came over the bridge, and I said to him, I, I really want to say it straight. I want to say it just like it is. He said, of course. I said, that jacket is so ugly. <laughs> it's torn, it's got spots on it, it doesn't look good on you, and I hate the fact that you took it. And I said, it's not fair, because it's our anniversary and we're going to an elegant place, and then you wear like this ugly thing. <laughs> okay. And then as I'm saying this, a lid opens, and my whole childhood comes to the surface. Two parents having gone through the Holocaust, wanting their daughters to actually find a good match, taking us to very elegant places, and my father has got a jacket. And that jacket is old, it's torn on the inside. I'm a little girl and I'm really embarrassed about my two parents who don't look like the other people's parents. And suddenly, everything the Holocaust, my parents wish to have their daughters have a different life than they have. And he held me in my deep embarrassment, in my love for my parents and the loss that I felt. I understood them in a whole new way. Through this experience of listening to her and her connection that she made with her childhood, uh, I was able to feel compassion for her and realize it's not about the jacket. It's about an old story that she was carrying around. And of course, you know, if it made her feel better, then I would want to wear the jacket. I said to Yumi, wear the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about the jacket, you know, wear it. And he said, no, 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 we're going to a store and we're finding an elegant jacket. And you're going to be walking with a guy who's got a terrific jacket. <laughs> but what we did is we put our energy in the service of our connection. People are not aware of how much pain they carry around because of the disconnection they have from friends, family, anybody in the world. Both Haiti and I, the pain of disconnection was the hatred we felt for Germans and for all those who cooperated with the Germans in exterminating the Jews in Europe. Not going to Germany and Austria, the hatred that we carried around with us is a prison for us. even buy a matchbox that says made in Germany. That is how much pain, sorrow, loss we felt connected with those two nations. And we really understood that unless we heal that pain enough to be able to cross the bridge and come to Austria and come to Germany and work with Austrian and Germans, we are in a prison. Ja, ich bin, ich bin ein äh, orthodoxischer Jude und die orthodoxischen Juden gehen immer mit dem Kopf eingedeckt als, äh, als ähm, Respekt zum so. lieben Gott, wie der Papst. So, ja, zeitlich zu sein ist eine gute äh, Gewohnheit, aber Energie gibt es nicht dort, wann Ich habe nicht etwas eine Geschichte. What you learn here is a, a structure, something you can grasp with your mind or with your brain, but you also learn examples. That's examples which you practice. Aber ich lade dich ein, zu mir zu kommen über die Brücke. Ich habe eine Frustration. Ich bin frustriert. 
weil du in unserem Bad deinen Porzellanbecher neben den Warmwasserhahn gestellt hast. Es tut mir weh, dass dieser Raum unser gemeinsamer Raum ist und ich ihn nicht frei betreten. Dieses Gefühl erinnert mich daran, unwichtig war. Du nimmst die Hände, so wie man ein Kind eine Geschichte erzählt. Du nimmst die Hände von Axel. Es gab mal einen kleinen Jungen und der hieß Axel. Und er fühlte sich nicht wichtig. Er fühlte sich unwichtig. Wollte er einen Platz haben, an dem er wichtig war. Zum kleinen Axel hätte ich gesagt, du hast recht, du hast ein Anrecht auf deinen Raum. Du mal groß bist, dann heirate ich dich. <lacht> Und dann passe ich auch, dass du viel Platz bekommst. <lacht> Im Gegensatz dazu, dass im Alltag viele Menschen einander okkupieren, irgendwo ungefragt ihre Fähnchen reinstecken, Kolonialismus betreiben, dass man hier einfach lernt, das Land des Anderen zu bewundern, zu schätzen und zu lieben und sich als Gast zu fühlen. Stellt das hier da eine Bibliothek? Sehen wir hier nicht äh, die, den Rücken? Es ist irgendwie, sie sind, wir wissen nicht, wer sie sind. Es ist ein Symbol für die äh, 65.000, hier steht österreichische Juden, wo man vielleicht auch sagen kann, dazu Wiener Juden. All we knew that the square uh, was the center of the old Jewish ghetto. In the middle of it, there is a memorial which actually covers an old synagogue. As we're walking around, we notice that around the memorial were the names of all the concentration camps, camps where Jews were exterminated by the Germans. Suddenly, there was Gers, the camp, labor camp, where my parents were, from which my mother engineered an escape. Then, as we're walking around, we found a um, sign, a tablet on the wall. Today, Christianity regrets its share in responsibility for the persecution of Jews and realizes its failure. The most important thing for me in terms of dealing with the past, being able to disconnect from it uh, the pain of it and the anger is to have acknowledgement. And as I was speaking, I see this lady with a kerchief and she stops in front of the memorial, in front of the door of the memorial and starts praying. At the end of the prayer, she crosses herself. Danke. Often. It was as if she, with her act, she was building a bridge from her world of growing up as a Christian and being a devout Christian and coming over the bridge that connects her world with my world, our world. One of the unforgettable moments of my life. And you know, my real wish is like the tipping point, mm -hmm. that that small idea of the bridge that connects the world and of the sacred space just keeps going from couple to couple and that suddenly 
Mm. There is this exponential growth mm. where it just becomes the known and understood thing on the planet. Mm. Mm. And that the idea of like putting a bomb in the space would just it would just be shocking, you know, like people couldn't even fathom mm -hmm. putting a bomb. It's like growing in a family that is not in peace. Like fights all the time, tension all the time, lack of love all the time, lack of communication all the time. So you you really are, you are really brought up into this very armed, very well prepared for war, but not for love. אני יודעת שכל התהליך הזה, גם שהביא אתכם לכאן, לכאן היה תהליך שעשינו אותו ביחד. Well, you know, Yumi and I speak six languages each, and what we found is that when we go to countries, we can cross the bridge to their country so much easier because we speak their language, and we think in their language. And so we've actually crossed the bridge to them and brought ourselves to them and so they can take our message of crossing the bridge and holding the space as sacred. They receive it very, very easily. Adi, I'd like to ask you to come to the gesher and to come to me. There's something that I don't know what will happen, that I want to tell you. Are you ready now? The whole environment, like in marriage, so between countries, and our country especially, Hostility is a very good protection. Like as long as you have a fight, you don't invest in growing. All over you there is a tension. Outside in the street there is a tension and, and you, you make a mistake and you turn on the television or read too much of the newspapers and, and you're tensed and you're sad and, and you're, you're really upset. And the power that the method gives to the conversation and to the understanding is, is quite amazing. We are working on creating little laboratories where couples or two people get together and learn how to connect with each other. So part of the vision is that enough laboratories get established around the world that is going to make an impact. Now, one starts. Everyone does it in their own way, until we feel that we are without a doubt. How is that? One unit. One unit. These rabbis started out by coming to a workshop with us, with their partners, and then came to many, many trainings. And now they're doing courses for principals of school, teaching them the new way of learning. And it's making a profound change in the schools that they have connected with. The most profound experience that I had was when you told us to make space. And I think if there's, if, there's, um, if there's hope for us in being real with that, not pretending that those differences don't exist, not making believe as if now we're all going to hug and, and, and the things that divide us will be gone, but rather that we'll find a, a, a commonality of, of humanity. I just really read a saying that's touching me deeply, which is, an enemy is someone whose story you don't yet know. And I think that it is through the hearing of each other's story and the learning about each other's world and struggle that we can actually begin to form the third option. You know, the idea of when there are two options, pick the third one, the third option that isn't born yet, but that can be born out of our connection. The wall is like the telephone. It's a place where I connect with my family. And I left uh, Romania when I was uh, 13 during World War II. Spent a year in Palestine, I was here. 
It's the only remnant of the temple. It's the only thing that remained from the second temple, which was destroyed uh, some 2,000 years ago. Usually soldiers come to do a ceremony of the yeah, steps being of being sworn in as yeah, soldiers. And this uh, morning was very touching to us in particular because these were not fighting units, but units who learn how to create a bridge at checkpoints and learning to speak Arabic, to understand the needs of the Palestinians, for example, who are crossing so that it can be done in a way that honors who they are as people. So they're learning their language. And it's exactly what we're teaching really is about how you cross the bridge to the other person and step into their world and for a while learn them. When life gives you a crisis, it's easy to forget the bridge. I was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was devastating. It was horrendous news. But Jimmy and I really knew how to cross the bridge to each other, and we had learned about the space. And we started to laugh together. And that whole adventure we did in that way. We invited each other over the bridge so the space between us could stay very safe because we needed a safe space. And so just that capacity for me to leave the world where I was so scared. And then he would come to me to visit me when, for example, I got very, very scared. He would leave his world and his fear. It created a an ability to deal with what potentially could be a huge crisis, to deal with it, okay, like a challenging event, but it's not the end of the world. Four years ago, Yumi got two stents in one of his arteries. And the doctor said, you know, Yumi, better you rest. And Yumi said to me, you know, we had a trip planned to South Africa. We're going to South Africa. I said to him, you're nuts. He said to me, we're going. Can you tell that there was the beginning of pollution? <laughs> <laughs> I really got so upset at him for being so, you know, thoughtless about his own health and body, etc., that I did the very best thing I knew to do next, which is to call our sons and tell them that their father is nuts. <laughs> which they agreed with. <laughs> you know, suddenly we looked at each other and we said, aren't we teaching something about a bridge <laughs> and visits? Aren't we like standing in front of groups and letting them know that it's important to honor the space. And we said to each other, yes, we are actually. We probably ought to do it. And as soon as he landed in my world, I burst out crying. And I said to him, Yumi, I can't lose you. This is what it's all about. I am so afraid you're gonna die. I finally know how to love you, and I finally know how to let you love me, and I finally feel connected. It's taken us years and years. You cannot die on me. Oh, that was just very, very good. I was, I was integrated again, and I could, I could come to visit him. Explain to her that, um... She needs to realize that I'm not just a heart, but that I'm a man with a heart. I'm a man with a heart. What does that mean? What did I mean by that? I meant, you know, that I, my life is what I, we need to think about. It's not only my heart, but if my life becomes meaningless because I'm gonna concentrate on worrying about my heart, you know, then why live? Oh. What a concept. I had only been focusing on his heart. I had forgotten 
that he is a man with a heart, a whole person that also has a heart. I repeated that statement after taking it in deeply. It just resonated in my whole being. Statement number two that I will never forget. He said to me, this man with this heart wants to answer yes to the question, is this a good day to die? <gasps> yes, that was a wow. He has the right to choose his full aliveness. And so I, as his partner, his ally, his champion, his friend, his best friend, my job is to support his full aliveness. Everything we're doing is about helping each other in connection to liberate the potential for exuberance, for joy, for full aliveness. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> So far, it's been two months, and it's been a bit um, spicy uh, in a way that is ridiculous because we're just dealing with one of the most serious things a couple can deal with. I was getting really burnt out and tired from all the travel back and forth. No, it's, you know, it hasn't disappeared, but it's like we have a way to talk through it. We don't, we're not run by it anymore. We have a bit of a issue whether there's such thing as happily ever after. And, uh, that kind of, she said she believed in happily ever after. Which is new. We recently sort of did fall back into some old patterns of not communicating very well, um, but we were able to kind of take a step back and say, all right, what did we learn? And, and you know, let's cross the bridge, let's talk about this. There's more of a lightness, more, I guess, comprehension and willing to... Understanding. We do communicate more deeper than we used to before. And it's not with anger, it's with calm. We're not so caught up in who's right and who's wrong. I think it's just, I realized that he has little boy needs and I have little girl needs. And I was just so aware of my little girl needs that um, I wasn't seeing kind of beyond them. When life gets a little bit stressy, you may forget that you have a space and you may forget that you have a bridge. And then your job is to have two chairs across from each other to look into each other's eyes with that new look that says it's you. Those chairs are there as an invitation to remember the bridge and remember the space. We saw that couples are profoundly inspired, that they do understand that it is their responsibility to create a sacred space because their children grow in that space. We really envision that there will come a day where our planet could be a safe planet because as couples, honor the space. Nations can begin to honor the space, and as nations honor the space, we have a safe planet for our children. I'm looking at the wall that, uh, that is uh, created, which is the way it resembles the wall the, in Jerusalem. But it's built stone by stone, you know, stone by stone. And I look at couples as the building bricks that can build a new world.
loving, wonderful mom, the most sweetest love. I love you. Hear me, I love you. Juicius, most loving, biggest hearted woman I know. Absolutely. 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 Absolutely